and I, I guess when you come back in, then you're going to put fresh tires and fuel? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to get out of the garage. Just going to come back out with fresh tires and fuel. Now, testing three or four laps is only for travel. Okay, when you're testing three or four laps, you're going out there making sure that splitter's not hitting the track and, and, run, and running the, the preferred racing line because where you're going to want to be most of the time when you're running is making sure the car is handling and not hitting the track too much. But a little bit of a scrape here and there is kind of what you're after because if you've got that little bit of a scrape in the bump, then you know that splitter's sitting right there on the track and the only reason it's hitting the track is because there's a dip. So that, that's a, an indicator when you, and I'm doing this telling you because a lot of people don't use telemetry. With telemetry, I, I couldn't care less if it makes a sound. You know, I'm gonna run three or four laps and I'm gonna look up here and see where my lines are telling me it's doing, which is a big help. But before I started using telemetry and you know, tied sign up for two hours on the telephone teaching me how to do it. Uh, before that, it was all noise. I would turn my motor halfway down and turn the crash sounds all the way up. That way the motor, when I got out there on the track, I could hear that thing scrape, jump, jump, hear, hear it hitting the track. So if, if it was hitting the track through 60 or 70% of the corner, I'm too low. But if it was just riding around the racetrack and all of a sudden it would just scrape at a dip or a bump, then I know I'm right where I need to be or close to where I need to be. And that's four or five laps. Now, cambers is a different story. I'm not, I don't like checking my cambers under 10, 12 laps because you're gonna get a good read on what your cambers are doing in the sim. Now, telemetry is a little bit different. I can get a little better read off of three or four laps off of my cambers. But in the sim itself, uh, looking at the, uh, looking at the tire, tire temperatures. And actually, I, I'll give iRacing a little bit of credit as far as telemetry and what you see up here is not a lot different. There's a, some minor differences, but you can get a good camber read on, on what your front tires are doing uh, with what iRacing gives you up here. I, they do a good job with that. So your cambers are pretty close up here. And keeping that spread, uh, that temperature spread to as close as possible within a 10 to 12 degree split is a good thing, but make sure you always check your tire wear. Because if your tread wear is running, say this right front has got say 10 degrees, uh, let's say 148 and 138 after about a 10 or 12 lap run, but you're looking at 97 and 100, then this thing is still, got, is still over cambered, even though it's within a 10 degree spread. So you're wearing more than your temperature is showing you. So you'll need to bring that camber down so you're rolling that tire over on that right front, right side of the tire a little bit more. So don't just go by your temperatures. Also look at your tire wear and keep that as even as you can across the, the, the whole level of the tire or the whole surface of the tire. That way you know the, every inch of tire you've got is going through, is hitting the track. All right. Now that's pretty much the basic setup, okay? And tying the front end down, if you'll use a min, uh, sometimes you'll need a, a little a minimum of arm symmetry will also help tie that front end down. Put a little arm symmetry in it, and then reset your ride heights back to where they were. You can get them close, and then you can use cambers to adjust ride heights to get everything back to where about where it was. Uh, that will help to tie that left front down with a little bit of arm symmetry. The trick is now is when you put arm symmetry in it, you're also stiffening the front end up, you're also tightening the car up. So you can't just say, okay, well, if I want to tie the left front down, let's just put all the arm symmetry in it, put the biggest sway bar I can in it, and that left front ain't never lifting off the ground. Well, it doesn't work that way. There's a, there is a balance to all of it between your preload your arm symmetry, your front sway bar. My front sway bar is nine times out of 10 is gonna be between a two, two and a half, two and three quarter. On the, I like a big sway bar and I like small springs. There's guys out there that'll run bigger springs and smaller sway bars and run just as fast as not better. There's no right way of doing this. There just isn't. There's the guys, the book that you guys have got, uh, me and Mark Boaster worked on 
some, and he done a great job. That read you have in the back of that book that talks about coil binding and bump stops is what I sent to signing them to have put in that book. I mean, that's a great read. That'll give you a really good idea of what coal binding and bump stops does. But and the, there was one of the guys I forget who it was now. One of the guys put up a uh, a thing in the forums here a little not too long ago that shows you exactly what he does for mile and a half tracks. Here's how you set up a mile and a half track. It's in there. Yo, is it in there? And that's a great tool to have. Okay, but don't depend on it. The reason why I say that is, is because if you go to saying, okay, now I'm at a mile and a half, here's what I need to do to set it up, you're putting yourself in a box. You're, not, you're totally closing yourself off to trying anything new. Okay, once you start, read that, use it as a guide, absolutely. But as an absolute to how, okay, this is how I need to make a mile and a half track set up, it, don't do that because then you're, you're, you're limiting yourself to never trying something to say, well, let's see what this does. Because it's not in that paper. Well, it won't work because it's not here. Well, that's not true. Because the the actual the guy that's made that I've had setups that had nothing to do with what he made, and was watching him in my mirror go away from me after 15 laps. So there's different ways of doing this. Uh, you can there's no right way of doing this. You can do this totally the opposite of what I'm telling you. Make them up with a setup that just kill everybody every week. It, it can be done that way. So don't put yourself in a box thinking, okay, well, this is what David said we need to do. Use that as a guide, but then go off and venture a little bit. Try to figure out your own little ways here. That's where the secrets come from with guys like Tyler and Ray and, and those guys, how a lot of the stuff that they find, that's where it comes from is getting in there and say, well, I wonder what this does. Next thing you know, you've found something that's sitting on the racetrack better than anybody else has found. So just don't put yourself in a box by going exactly by those guides. All right. Now, going into packages, using with the A car, you're not able to use the shocks as much. The B car now, just to venture off it for a second, that B car, I have found that loosening that B car up with a little bit of track bar, by bringing your track bars up a little bit, and using my favorite package on that B car, as far as shots are concerned, which I have found actually works halfway decent to stabilize the car, is to alternate the front shocks. To run a 32 right front bump, uh, let's see, wait a minute, a 32 right front rebound, a 20 to 25 right front bump, do a 20 to 25 left front rebound and a 32 left front bump. Alternate the way it, it transfers the weight. If you'll do that, and sometimes you can allow for a little bit more travel in the front springs with that big a shock package in it. Next time you run, play in with the B car, go out and just try it. It'll tighten you up a little bit, but see how it stabilizes the car. Put that say a 25-32 a in the right front, 32-25 in the left front. And when you go into the corners, that thing will sit there and just ride like you're driving a Cadillac. Man, it just smooths that B car out, especially on the mile and a half. Now, places like Phoenix, things like that with the flat tracks, you, it's not going to work. But you get those mile and a half, like Texas, Charlotte, uh, places like that, that you can, you've got to a lot, have a lot of speed in the corners and stability in the corners. Try that out in the B car. Uh, that that I found a lot of success with that front sprout shot package. But as far as a spring package, working the rear springs and the front springs together, one thing that I have actually, to be honest with you, with over the last month working with this A car, one of the biggest things I've learned, and and it does, it's not as prevalent in the B car as it is the A car, but when you have springs up front that have so much travel to go down, remember those things also travel up. So the bigger those front springs are, the higher it's gonna travel back up when you get on the straightaways. So I have found that using high speed racetracks, and uh, I'll even give you a little bit of a, uh, for you guys that love those super speedways. Uh, when you get in this A car, Daytona, Talladega, Remember, 
that front spring may only have so much to travel going down, but the less it has to travel coming back up, the more that splitter stays on the ground. So when you go to building a Daytona set or a Talladega set with this A car, remember that, that that front those little bitty front springs might be something to play with. So anytime you're traveling with with mile and a half with the high speed racetracks, remember that the springs not only go down, they come back up. So the less you can have them come up to bring that splitter up off the ground, the more you're going to have travel. I mean, the more you're going to have the splitter sealed off is what I meant to say. Now the rear springs, uh, as a as a package, affecting the front uh, the front springs, is when you set get that thing into the into the uh, straightaways where you're really looking for your speed, you want those rear springs to come up to kind of push down on the front. So that's where the whole trick to finding this, especially with the A car, is getting those rear springs to where they'll squat enough in the corners to where everything will set level. It doesn't set too much in the back. It doesn't set too much in the front. It's finding the whole four spring package to where when it goes into the corners and the weight, the gravity and weight makes it want to glue itself to the racetrack is to finding the whole four spring package that they all squat together. So there's where the spring package comes in as far as using your rear springs to affect your front springs and your left sides to affect your right sides as to far as how they, they come back up on the straightaways and how it squats in the center. So using that spring package when you're, when you're building your setups and you're starting to get that front splitter to where when you're going through the corners here at Texas and it just scrapes a little bit on that dip, but now you're getting to the exit of the corner and you're turning the car left and when you get especially off of two here where it flattens out all of a sudden the car doesn't want to go to the wall. It wants to just keep rotating toward the left. Okay, too much rotation, nine times out of 10 is too much right rear spring. If the car over rotates, you can fix that a lot with less right rear spring. That does two good things. That stops rotation off the corner. It also brings the right rear of the spoiler out of the air. If you can put a little softer right rear spring in it, it's always a good thing because it helps that rear end squat a little bit better down the straightaways. So when you're working with rotation, now that's now keep in mind, rotation and loose is two totally different things. A car being loose is a car that has no grip in the rear tires. A car over rotating, which a lot of people will say, my car's loose, man, it's wanting to spin out. Well, it may not be loose as far as that's concerned. It may just be rotating too much, too much right rear spring. Now, if you've got a car that's coming off the corners and you can feel the rear tires spinning, it's usually too much track bar. This A car likes those track bars to be in the, uh, toward the bottom because there's so much power in this thing. When you're getting on that throttle, those track bars being toward the bottom helps that car have rear grip coming off. So I, using the track bars and the springs to give you that rear grip and to keep that car squatting. With the A car, I'm finding it's a pretty good rule of thumb that you're going to want smaller rear springs. Somewhere in the 350 to 450 range on the left rear, somewhere but depending on the left rear between a 500 and a 600 on the right. I'm, let's see, I can't, I can't remember a setup that I actually had more than a 600 right rear spring. I think there, I think there was one, but it's rare that I go above a 600 pound right rear spring on the A car. I'm usually in that five, 550 range on that right rear. That left rear is usually somewhere around a three, 350, depending on the track, the amount of banking, you know, the amount of rotation I need. So you're actually, it, it's not all that uncommon to have your front springs and your rear springs to be pretty close to the same. Just the opposite sides, you'll have a little more travel in the left front than you will the right front, just to keep that left front pinned. Because when the weight transfers, you need a little bit more spring to allow it to come down to touch the track more. So don't be afraid to uh, to with this A car to adjust those those rear springs down 
to keep them a little closer to the front spring so when the car goes in the corners it all kind of squats the same. Now the B car is a little bit different. Uh, you'll want, because the B car has nothing but coil bind, it doesn't have the bump stops, you will want that B car to be in a 325 to a 425 range, a little bit more of a split from right to left. You'll want that left front to travel a little bit more. Uh, but you can adjust how the car handles with your uh, your front springs as far as your amount of coil bind. But your uh, your rear springs compressing those front springs are usually going to be a little bit higher with the B car depending on where you're at. Somewhere usually around a 450 to a 550 on the left rear and you'll get up into that 800 to 1200 range on that right rear in the B car a lot on these uh, on these mile and a half tracks, just using these mile and a half for an example. Because you need more support in that right rear and that B car just to keep it, because uh, that B car is so much more of a momentum car. Having that support to when you get on the gas, it doesn't make the rear end just disappear from you, it keeps it up. That's where that rotation comes from. So, one thing, one of the big things I want, especially with everybody at Vegas, uh, this week in the A car. I don't know if you guys are like me, but one of my scariest parts of, of Vegas, let's see, Vegas, uh, Chicagoland, is across the start finish line in that little bend of the trioval. In this A car, that rear end wants to go, woo, right? Rear cambers. Close those rear camber splits up. If you're having trouble, with the car getting a squirrely through the triovals, especially if you have to, if somebody's gotten underneath you coming out of four at Vegas, and you're having to ride that high line in the trioval, and you're having to turn the car a little bit more left to go through the trioval because somebody's underneath you there, look at your rear cambers in this uh, in this A car, and close those up a little bit instead of say a two one three one, which is kind of like it's it's, it's going to react the same as a, a spring split would with that inch of rear travel what that is is rear travel uh, you like right now if you're looking up here the track bar I've got two and a half inches of rear travel in that track bar so the rear the, the rear of the car is going to steer two and a half inches left okay well that camber is basically the same thing you can just kind of adjust it a little it's a little bit more of a minor adjustment so say a two point a two one left front or left rear camber and a two seven to a two eight right rear camber going through that trioval at Vegas and the car gets a little happy on you, go down to about a two five. Now you may have to readjust that right rear track bar to give you that because it will tighten the car up. It'll give you a little more right rear grip. But if it makes it more stable and more easy feeling in the trioval at like Vegas, then that's the way you want to go with a little bit less camber split. That that will get rid of that that little bit of a a, a queasy feeling it gives you right there through the uh, trioval. Now your rear truck arm preload, and I'll get here and I'll see if anybody needs anything. But that rear truck arm preload, on most times I will keep it as close to zero as possible because I want my rear end to be neutral. Okay, I want it to be, I want to adjust my rear end with track bar and springs. So I don't want to have to worry about that preload to do that with. Now, one thing I want you to notice is that you can get that preload. Now, I've got my rear cameras at 2.1 and 2.3 with a negative 4.4 on the truck arm preload. Watch what happens when I take this rear, the right rear camber up to a 3.1. Watch that preload. See, now it's a 3.4. So the more you can go with a split on the left rear cambers, the closer you're going to get a negative preload to get towards zero. So the more neutral you're kind of making that rear end. Now there's a trade-off. Now you've got that split in those cambers. So a negative or a positive number on that towards zero on that truck arm preload is not necessarily a bad thing. I think my I think my Vegas set's sitting at about a positive 3.5 right now. Uh, and that's before I left, so I hadn't done a whole lot of work to it yet. 
but it was feeling really good through the triable. I, I, that was the first thing I'd done with Vegas was stabilize that triable or that start-finish line. All right, anybody got anything? Have, have I lost somebody? Yes, sir. So again, you, you talked earlier about the three-way combination of front preload, front ride heights, and travel and front springs tying the left front down. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, ballast forward and uh, front weight? Cross weight? No, the front the, weight. Yeah, the nose weight? Nose weight. Right. How they factor into that equation. Okay, now, all right, uh, that's not a bad question at all. Your nose weight, and with this A car, I'm finding that it's not a big fan of a lot of nose weight. Uh, the B car, now that car likes a lot of nose weight. Uh, I'll, a lot of times my B car, I'll be 20, 25 inches of nose weight on that B car, and it'll just run like a champ. But this A car, I put 20 inches in it, and the thing shoves the nose all the way up to the wall. Because with the with the B car, you put that nose weight in it, you're compressing those springs, and it's setting those coil, but it's getting it coil bound quicker, keeping that front splitter on the ground. With the A car, what you're doing with that nose weight is setting it on top of the bump stop. Well, when you set it on top of the bump stop with that much weight, that bump stop just sort of starts giving. Next thing you know, you're scraping that splitter, and off the off you go. So I'm finding that the A car likes to have a little bit less nose weight. Now I'll use that nose weight uh, as a, to me, as a balance between speed and handling as far as what I need the car to do in the center. If I'm sitting at a zero front ballast so I can get as much speed out of the car as I can possibly get with the, as much weight to the back so when the thing keeps that that spoiler out of the air tries to keep that car sitting down as low as possible. If the car is just squirrely loose or if I'm just uncomfortable with it, then I'm going to start adding a couple of inches at a whack just to get the car more comfortable. A little bit of nose weight is going to give you a little more of a comfort level. Uh, and that's not so much to do with speed, but more to do with how you feel sitting in the race car. Because the car can be just the fastest thing on earth. But if you can't drive it but two laps, what good is it? So you've got, to have, you've got to find that balance of the speed you need with that handling that when you get it in dirty air and get it around a, a, a group of other drivers that you can still drive that race car with the amount of confidence and comfort you need. That's what that nose weight's gonna, gonna do for you, basically. But now the A car, like I say, the A car will use a, a lot less nose weight than the B car will just because of what it does to the bump stops as opposed to what it does to a coil bind. Okay? That answer you, you know, get you? All right, anybody else? Man, I'm doing good. Okay, let's see, where was I? Okay, uh, the tape everybody knows. I, I don't think I don't I don't think I've been in somewhere this this season at least that I've run less than forty. Uh, I know the iRacing setups always start at 30. I ain't never figured out why. I just make the thing 40% where everybody's going to run it anyway. Uh, with the A car, one thing that I, I don't know if any of y'all do it a lot is I don't pay a lot of attention as, as far as just exactly how much corner weight is on these tires. You know, the numbers that that corner weight has, 976, 770 on the left, as far as those numbers are concerned, that's what I was talking to you about earlier. If I start worrying about exactly how many pounds I have on each tire, I'm starting to overthink it a little bit. I'm starting to make it just more complicated than it actually needs to be. So keeping it a little bit simple is always a good thing. It, it, it does two things. It'll, it'll help you to not cloud your, your head with so many numbers that now you're just overthinking everything and, and you've kind of lost your way. And it'll also keep it more fun. Because remember, this is this still fun, man. I mean, we're not, I, like I say at, at every seminar, we don't get paid in money to do this. You get paid in respect. You know, so the more respect you have, the richer you are. So that goes in, which we'll, we'll talk about later when we start talking about racecraft. But it's the same way with making these setups, man. I just, you got to keep it fun. If you start overthinking it and start wondering, worrying about, okay, exactly what, okay, this week you may think, do that and your setup just may blow everybody away, great. 
you know, you've won five races this week, man. You're on top of the world. Well, next week you just drove yourself so crazy trying to figure out how to do it again that now you're wanting to quit. You know, I got to take two weeks off now. Well, what, you know, what good do you do? You make the setup as good as you can. And then if you finish fifth with a setup that you made, I promise you, will be ten times as rewarding as finishing first with my setup. You know, if I give you a setup, you go out and win a race, man, you're going to be a happy man. But if you finish fifth with a setup that nobody helped you do, I promise you, you'll love that fifth a lot better than that first you've done with mine because you didn't have the part in making that setup. So enjoy the, this part of it, which is what I do. Making these setups now, the, the thinking part of this is actually what I enjoy doing of this. So just keep that in mind when you're making this. Don't let it over. Don't let it overwhelm you. Don't let it over, don't let it make you overthink. Just enjoy trying to figure out what each part of this setup does to the race car when you're on the track. And I promise you, you'll get the more you do that, the more you'll get into going. Oh, man, this is kind of neat. And you'll get to where you do what I do now, and you can't get up, and your girlfriend's hollering at you, telling you come eat. Uh. Okay, we've talked about front springs. I've talked about rear springs. There's not a whole lot I can do with you with the shock speed. Uh, the truck arm mounts. Your, your rear truck arm mounts are going to give you rotation if you, uh, if you do them like what they've got right here. I don't know if a lot of y'all can see that or not, what y'all can see. But being on the bottom on the left and top on the right, that's going to give you a lot of rotation. Okay, so you can actually use less spring split with that kind of truck arm split. Because that effect that that gives you that effect of, of rear springs at kind of a more of a major uh, adjustment. I I'm not a fan of running them opposite like that. I usually like to do that with springs. A lot of guys do, and if I do run them opposite, it's usually the other way around on flat tracks. Just because I want that right rear bike, and I want that left rear entry. Because that left that left rear on the top is going to give you a good entry into the corners, and that right rear on the bottom is going to give you that good squat and bite off when you're coming off of New Hampshire, Milwaukee, uh, in the B car, uh, uh, Phoenix last week. If you've got that right rear uh, down on the bottom, now you can also accomplish that if it does give you a little bit of a different feel to the race car. Okay. Most of mine, I'll be honest with you, most of mine, I will either put top or bottom depending on the racetrack. Phoenix, uh, just using my B car, for example, at Phoenix, I run both of them on the bottom to give me grip off throughout the whole run because a, a, an asphalt track is tendency to get to lose a lot of rear grip on a flat track like that. But then I, what I call, or what a lot of southern uh, late model drivers call is hillbilly and the rear track bars. I'll run both truck arms on the bottom, but then I'll reverse the rear track bars. Send that left rear track bar up to about a 9.5 or a 10 to give me that good entry, and send that right rear track bar down to about a 6.5 to give me that grip off. And there, I don't think I found one or two people that, that could touch me at Phoenix last week. And I'm, uh, and if Jared or Tyler or Ray would have had that set up, there's no way in the world I'd ever call them. Because, the, I mean, at Phoenix last week, that thing was just glued. And that's all because of hill building that track bar to give them their tires bite. So the, there's so many different ways, like I told you about those paperwork. There's no way of doing this a right way. There's only, the, the only way to do this is the way it works. And it has nothing to do with a certain direction. There is no right numbers. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Anybody got anything? Something you don't mess with. Is there something you, you do not mess with? Um, wow. If there's anything on this, on this thing that I just do not mess, and actually there's probably not a, there's not a tweak on here that I will not do or that I do not do. But if there's anything that is close to not being messed with, he's, he's probably right. Is that left rear rebound. Uh, and I will, 
uh, just it on occasion. If I can use a little less right rear spring to stop the rotation to have the car flatten out off the corner and use a little bit of left rear rebound to give me that late flip, that late exit rotation, I'll do, but it's not often. Because that, to me, that left rear rebound is just deadly. Uh, everything I've ever put it on, when you get out there on the corners, even if it's working at the start of the run, when you get to that half tank part of the run and the rear end started lightening up, that left rear rebound is going to pop that left rear up is, re is what it's doing. So when you come off of a corner that's flat like two at Texas, and that left rear rebound comes on on about a half a tank and takes that left rear up, the first thing it's going to do is bring that tail in toward that wall. Just and all of a sudden, too, it's not a gradual thing. You're coming off and just all of a sudden it'll just whoop with that left rear rebound picking that rear end up. So I, he's, he, that's probably about as good an answer as I could have given you right there is that left rear rebound I'm not going to mess with much. Other than that, Everything is fair game. Uh, the front toe end on these A cars, I'm usually at a negative two left, a zero positive one on the right. Uh, that's a pretty good rule of thumb for me. Uh, the one I pulled up here that uh, sign had, he was like at a negative four on that left. Uh, I, I changed that right off. I said, man, I ain't tearing that tire up. But he might have found something in telemetry that worked with that negative four. So I'll probably, I, when I get home and I'm not talking to y'all, I'm probably going to figure out what that was for. Uh, but, but that's about right, though. That's, that left rear rebound is probably about the only thing that I won't put a lot of effort into because I just, I just do not like that left rear rebound. Yeah, that negative I, four was part of my tire hack. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's, that's that F5 secret. button up here. Top secret. We've got a few, few, we can take a few more questions if you have them. A few more. Yes, let me get you on the mic. Um, I know iRacing has just recently put that uh, steering offset down. I was just wondering what that does and, you know, is it just personal preference or does it really help in the corners or anything? I'm just confused on what it actually does. Okay, what it is, what the purpose of that is for is to do exactly what, what the cup drivers do. When you see that yellow tape over the center of their uh, steering wheel, uh, what it's actually meant to do is for you to be able to take that steering wheel and make it center because your car naturally with the cambers and the way the springs are, your car's naturally gonna turn left. Okay, so instead of having to turn the wheel slightly to the right to make it go straight, what that offset is to do is to exactly what the cup drives do. They offset that wheel to where your shaft is actually turning right, but they pull the wheel off and set it on there straight. So the car is actually steering a little bit right, but their wheel is straight. So it gives it's a little bit more of a reference to them. But what I have found out with my testing of this is that if you've got your wheel straight, say you like a 12 steering box and a 12 steering box is running slightly to the right down the straightaways like what we're normally used to doing, if you'll take that thing and put it at a, say, a negative two to where it brings your steering wheel straight, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't compensate for that in your left turn. Okay, the, the, the problem I have found with that is is when you put that negative two and now your wheel is straight going down the straightaway, what you had to do going into the corner is to turn the car left to get the steering wheel right here to get the car to turn where it needs to. Now you have to turn it to here. Because now it's, instead of moving it to where you're still turning it the same route, except your steering wheel is just straight, you're having to actually turn the wheel more, you're having to put more wheel into it to compensate for what you just done down the straightaway. So that's the bad part about it. The good part is now you can actually use a 10 steering box on tighter racetracks like Martinsville or uh, Phoenix, something that has tighter corners. You can actually now use a 10 steering box, which in the past would have just been too, too drastic when you 
you know, you barely turn the wheel, the car just wants to jerk with a, a tighter tearing, uh, steering box. Now you can take that 10, put it at a positive two or a positive four. Now you're having to turn it right just a little bit more, but you're able to put that same amount of wheel in the corners with a 10 that you was having to use a 12 to do. So now you've got a quicker amount of steering that will get you around the corners better and still able to put the same amount of wheel in the car. So that's the good part about it. The bad part is, is when you get the car centered, you have to put more wheel into it than you did before you do that. So that's what that's for. That's the good and the bad of that, uh, that new adjustment that iRacing put in it. All right, we got one more question here, Michael. Yes. I hear the terminology, uh, let the tire pressures build up. Mm -hmm. At iRacing, how many laps does it take for the tire pressures to actually build up? Uh, depending on the racetrack, uh, let's see here. It all depends on the racetrack uh, as far as uh, speed-wise, like the mile and a half. Uh, you, you're probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of full pressure between 10 and 12 laps. Uh, the shorter tracks like Phoenix, things like that, it's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, probably, you, I would say any racetrack you're going to go to, anywhere between 10 and 20 laps, you're going to be about right at a full song as far as your tire pressures are concerned. And, and speaking of uh, one thing I will tell you, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, your hot tire pressures right here remember that that these tire pressures are, are like I told you earlier they're like springs so when these tire pressures when you get them up say 10 or 12 laps and this tire this hot tire pressure is at say 55.7 and this hot hot tire pressure is at 54.7 if you want that car to be balanced throughout a whole run drop this right rear tire pressure a pound get these hot tire pressures after the pressures have built up to be close to even left and right look at those hot tire pressures if you'll get those to where when they're getting hot that they're building up to the same pressure on both sides as far as like uh 54.7 on your rights and 44.7 on your lefts at hot tire pressure then you've got a 10 pound spread throughout the whole run and you may have to adjust uh, a rear tire pressure down or up a pound so your, your actual tire pressures may be off by one or two pounds front to rear but your hot tire pressures at the run are now all of a sudden they're all building up to where they're the same throughout the run that's where a lot of my long run stuff comes from is getting those hot tire pressures to be exactly where I want them at a half a tank and three quarters of a tank cool excellent can we give David a hand clap Thank you.